Hey everyone, Morgan here. So we're going to be finishing up the AP Chem Lecture Outline on liquids and solids today. So we're going to talk about the liquid state at this point. And it's going to be a discussion beginning with vapor pressure. So imagine that we have a container. We'll put some water in the bottom of it. And we seal the container and you'll put a rubber stopper and a flask type thing. Now, if you allow this to sit and come to equilibrium, what will happen is some of the liquid will evaporate. A small number of water molecules would go up into the gas phase and be flying around inside that flask. And this is going to be a dynamic equilibrium. Every time a water molecule leaves the liquid phase, one from the gas phase would have to go back into the liquid phase. So that at a constant temperature, you always have the same number of liquid molecules in this flask of specific volume. And it would exert a very specific pressure. And that pressure is called the vapor pressure. The pressure exerted above a liquid at a specific temperature. Now, if we're talking about something besides water, we need to understand that the intermolecular forces matter here. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the fewer molecules that are going to evaporate. Now, this is dependent upon temperature, but not on volume. Okay, Different volumes will still exert the same pressures, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. So in a sense, it is a measurement of the number of particles present above a liquid. Okay, now if we have a box, three-dimensional, it's going to be able to contain a gas. It's a specific volume V at a specific temperature T. We put some liquid in the bottom of this container and some of it is going to evaporate. Imagine that for this volume and this temperature, we just have three particles, and we're exaggerating here, okay, but you get the idea. And they're just flying around randomly, hitting the walls of the container. They're going to exert a specific pressure, which we'll call P, the vapor pressure. Now, if we make the box suddenly twice as big, but at the same temperature, what's going to happen is that the pressure is going to stay the same. It stays the same because instead of three particles, we're now going to have six flying around. Okay? And they will cause the same collisions as those three and exert the same pressure. Now, the number of particles did increase, but the pressure inside the container did not. So changing the volume of the container does not change vapor pressure. Changing the temperature would, but not changing the volume. Okay. Now, vapor pressures and IMFs. And it might even be more accurate here to say inner particle forces, but most of the time when we're talking about a liquid, it's going to be molecular. Most of the time. So if the IMFs are big, in a liquid. You will have high heat of fusion, high heat of vaporization, because it takes a lot of energy to cause a phase change. It'll have a high melting point, it'll have a high boiling point, because you have lots of attraction between the molecules in the liquid phase. Now, but if the IMFs are small, what that means is the vapor pressure is big, and all those others are small. So when IMFs are big, vapor pressure is small. When IMFs are small, vapor pressure is big. Basically, it's the IMFs that are preventing all of the molecules from suddenly flying around into the vapor phase. Okay, now, if we have two samples of a liquid, Erlenmeyer flasks, stoppered, etc. But there are two different temperatures. That means the higher temperature has a higher average kinetic energy. 
So we're back to the ice cream graph again. So at T1, the lower temperature, the blue line on this graph, you have a certain number of particles that go beyond that dotted vertical line. And we're just going to arbitrarily say that that is the amount of energy necessary for them to go into the vapor phase. Now, if you raise the temperature, which is the second flask, of that exact same liquid, same volume, nothing else changed, the particles will, on average, have a higher kinetic energy, which means more of them will be in the vapor phase. Okay? We're not changing the energy it takes for them to vaporize. We're just saying that more of them have it at the higher temperature. Okay, now we're going to make a nice little graphic here about changes in state, all right? And we're basically working our way up in this graphic, okay? Now, three boxes will represent the solid, the liquid, and the gas phase. Any phase change from the solid to the liquid is called melting, and any phase change from the liquid to the solid is called freezing. Any phase change from the liquid to the gas is called boiling. Any change from the gas to the liquid is called condensation. And we can also have a change from the solid to the gas, which is called sublimation, like what dry ice does, or from the gas back down to the solid, which is called deposition. Now, any phase change going up on this graph requires energy. So we say that's endothermic. We have to heat it to cause this to happen. Also increases randomness. And any change going down releases energy and would be called exothermic. Less randomness. You can pause this to get a good drawing done. Okay. Now. This is one of the coolest demonstrations I've ever been able to do, but can't do them in LA Unified. They don't allow us to have mercury. Did this back at the University of Wisconsin. You are familiar with what a barometer looks like, and this is a barometer, okay? Now, pool of mercury. The mercury is going up in this tube. There is a vacuum above the mercury, okay? And typically at one atmosphere, that goes up 760 millimeters. So 760 millimeters of mercury is called 760 torr. Now, using a little tube, kind of like a syringe, we're going to squirt some liquid into the bottom of that inverted burette. It's actually a gas collection tube, okay? Technically, it's called a udiometer, but gas collection tube. Now, let's squirt some water in. The water is less dense than the mercury, so it will make its way up through the mercury. It'll be pushed up. It'll float up, technically and a little pool of liquid water will collect at the top of the column of mercury. And that will evaporate to a certain extent. And if you let it sit for an hour and let everything come to equilibrium, what happens is the vapor pressure that that water exerts is 24 torr at 25 degrees Celsius. And that pushes the column of mercury down a little bit. Okay, and we can measure that difference in the height of the column, and that gives us the vapor pressure of the liquid. Now, if we were to increase the temperature, more would evaporate. If we decrease the temperature, less would evaporate. Okay, and that's basically what we do to make one of those tables of vapor pressure according to temperature. And you use that back with the gas law by this. Now, let's go to a liquid that has fewer intermolecular forces, okay? And this is ethanol. We talked about this back on about page four of the outline, I think, okay? Fewer IMFs, so it is, or we could say weaker IMFs, it's going to evaporate more readily, which means it's going to generate a higher vapor pressure. 
And you can see here that the column of mercury is pushed down farther. Now it only has a height of 695. So 760 minus 695, the difference is 65 torr. And that's the vapor pressure of the ethanol at 25 degrees Celsius. We can also do it for diethyl ether, which has a very high vapor pressure, and it would end up looking like this. You can't mix the liquids together. You can't do both water and ethanol in the same one. You would not be able to distinguish, okay, what the vapor pressure was according to one versus the other. And as we're going to learn in the next chapter, it's actually going to be a little bit of interaction between them. Okay. So this is how we measure vapor pressure through liquids. Now we have technology now that makes it a little bit different, a little bit easier to do, but this is a really ingenious way to do it and probably more accurate even than the ways with the technology we have. Okay, now when we plot vapor pressure as a function of temperature, what you're going to see is that this is a curve. Okay, this isn't exactly linear. Okay, the one for diethyl ether isn't even linear, even if it looks like it. So when you get up to a vapor pressure of 760 torr, that's the boiling point. So you can see here that for water that happens at 100 degrees Celsius, you know that's a normal boiling point of water. For ethanol at 78.4, you learned that one earlier too. Okay, I'm just back about page four. Now, I'm not thrilled with this being a curve because it's harder to work with. So I'd like to get this converted into a straight line. And this was done quite a while back, all right? And it turns out by playing around with the data, the plot of the natural logarithm of the vapor versus one over temperature gives us a straight line. That means we can turn this into a nice straight line equation like y equals mx plus b. And it's the natural log of the vapor pressure equals the negative, because the line's going down, of a constant, which would be the slope m. It just turns out that in this case, that constant is the heat of vaporization divided by r. And the only reason we're dividing by r is actually to get the units correct. Times 1 over t plus some type of a constant. Now, we can set this equal and get a 2 point form of this equation, okay, which is called the clausius clapeyron equation. This is a very useful equation. Now, the AP does not typically ask questions about this, but they do on the Chem Olympiad. So I have put examples of this in this lecture outline. But this, it turns out, we're going to see this form of equation coming back over and over and over again. It's going to help us in kinetics for determining rate constants. It's going to help us in equilibrium for determining equilibrium constants in all cases at different temperatures. Now, I'm going to do the math problems for this in a separate video, so just keep your eyes open for that one. Now, heating curves. You saw the heating curve for the first time last year. Uh, we did it as a uh, at-home lab after the shutdown began, okay? Did a little video in my kitchen, okay? Now, we also talked about this a bit back in chapter six when we're talking about heat suffusion. When you have a mixture of ice and water and the ice is melting, it's going to stay at a constant temperature, typically zero degrees Celsius. That's if everything's, you know, pure water, pure ice, one atmosphere of pressure, et cetera, et cetera. Now, once all of the ice is melted, it can actually start to warm up. And the warmest that you can measure, or that, I'm sorry, that you can raise water to, the highest temperature you can get it to, is 100 degrees Celsius. Once you hit that temperature, it's going to start boiling. And this is assuming one atmosphere of high pressure, okay? And after it is all boiled away, the temperature of the steam can go up, okay, but not the temperature of the mixture. Okay. Again,
again, this is kind of a review of some stuff, but it is really relevant to this chapter also. Now let's define boiling point, which we have not done, but we basically just said as the temperature which water boils, but it's not entirely true, okay? Specifically, it is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is exactly equal to one atmosphere. And again, we're calling this the normal boiling point. So that's, you know, when you're down at the beach, you know, a coastal city, typical one atmosphere of blood pressure. This is not the same on top of Mount Everest. <laughs> Now, the normal melting point is a little more convoluted. It's the temperature at which the solid and the liquid states have the same vapor pressure under conditions where the total pressure is one atmosphere. These are some restrictions we have to put on this, okay, making sure that everything's happening at one atmosphere. Now, phase diagrams, again, something not specifically tested on the AP anymore, but definitely tested on Chem Olympiad and I will test, okay? It's a plot of temperature versus pressure for a substance. Now, we're going to draw a big phase diagram for water. So, fill up that empty space in your outline, pressure versus temperature. And these are the three zones or regions that we're going to see on the phase diagram, the solid, the liquid, and the gas. And we know a little bit about water. We know that ice melts at zero degrees Celsius. So one atmosphere pressure, draw a line across to the solid liquid boundary, draw a line down, and that's gotta be at zero degrees Celsius. We will call that the normal melting point for water. Now continue to heat the liquid at one atmosphere. And when it starts to turn into a gas, we know that's the normal boiling point. And that's 100 degrees Celsius. Now, any point on the solid liquid boundary is a melting point. And any point on the liquid gas boundary is a boiling point, but not necessarily the normal melting point or the normal boiling point. You also see that we have here, all right, a boundary between the solid and gas at lower pressures where things sublime. Now there is something called the triple point, which we'll define in a couple of slides, and the critical point, which we'll define in a few more slides. Now the most important thing about this graph, which is for water, and a similar one exists for bismuth and antimony, okay? is that the solid to liquid boundary has a negative slope. Now this has a very important meaning. We can take spots down there below one atmosphere, stay at a constant temperature, and cross the boundary for solid to a liquid and melt water. So you can squeeze an ice cube and cause it to melt. Now, all of you kids from California are not experts in snowball fights, but when you get a snowball, you spend a lot of time squeezing it and compacting it, okay? That melts the water at the surface of the snowball and gives it a nice crust so that when you throw it, okay, it doesn't just fly apart, okay? Now, this negative slope also means, very importantly, that water, is less dense as a solid than as a liquid, or that ice cubes float. This is why you can't put a bottle of Coke in the freezer, because when it freezes, the volume expands and the glass breaks. Okay, now, carbon dioxide, different this time. It's a positive slope between the solid and the liquid. Carbon dioxide, we know, is sublime. So one atmosphere, okay, it goes straight into the gas phase. And the point, the temperature at which that happens is about negative 78 degrees Celsius. Sublimation there. And there's a triple point also. 
is a critical point. Okay. And the big thing to note is the positive slope of that solid liquid line, which means the liquid is less dense than the solid. And it was the opposite for water. Okay, so that point called the critical temperature, the temperature above which the vapor cannot be liquefied no matter what pressure is applied. That's actually kind of an interesting thing to see. And the critical pressure, the pressure required to produce liquefaction, okay, at the critical temperature. And when those two things come together, we get the critical point, the point where the critical temperature and critical pressure meet. And once you go up beyond the critical point, you get very different behavior for the gas. There's just no way for you to turn it back into a liquid no matter what pressure you apply. Now the triple point is the point where all three phases can coexist. That doesn't mean they do coexist. It just means that they can coexist at that point. And that is a function of temperature and pressure. All right. Supercooling and superheating. Interesting graph here for you to draw. We say that water, when we cool it down, and this graph is specifically for water, as we cool it down, when the liquid hits zero degrees, it freezes. That's a lie. Sorry. It actually has to be a little colder than zero for it to freeze. Now, once you get below zero degrees, the molecules are moving slow enough that the hydrogen bonding can kick in and cause everybody to, all the particles to align where they're supposed to be, okay? Now, once they have all become aligned, they turn into the solid. So it turns out the temperature jumps up a little bit back to zero degrees Celsius when that happens. And when I was in Wisconsin, I actually heard somebody talking about how, you know, I wish it would snow so it warms up. My first thought was, wow, that doesn't make any sense. Then I started thinking about this. It's like, yeah, actually, I, I know what that kid's getting at, okay? The energy released from the water turning into the solid, okay, that energy comes out. Okay, and that can cause, with a large volume of water, like snowfall, changes in temperature. Now, you can also superheat a liquid if you have a pressure applied to it. And that's the concept behind a pressure cooker. You can get the temperature of the water and steam inside the pressure cooker to be infinitely higher, okay, than 100 degrees Celsius and that causes the food to cook faster. Okay, now let's finish this up with a discussion of the boiling point of water as a function of altitude, which would be a function of atmospheric pressure. At the top of Mount Everest, the atmospheric pressure is only about 240 torr. So water boils at 70 degrees Celsius. Now, Whitney, which I think is the tallest point in California, about half that height, it's about 85 degrees Celsius. Now, basically, at sea level, atmospheric pressure is normal, 760 torr. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. But Death Valley is below sea level. Atmospheric pressure is actually a little bit higher. Not a lot. You don't really notice it. A little bit higher than normal. And the boiling point of water is a little bit above. So the 100.3 degrees Celsius. Now, go into the kitchen and find a box of brownie mix or cake mix or something like that. And you're very likely to find on it something called high altitude baking instructions. Because of the different boiling points of water, okay, at these different pressures, you have to have longer and shorter cooking. Okay, that's it for this one. Everybody have a good day. This is Morgan signing off.